My name is Vanessa Marcano Kelly. I was born in Venezuela. I am an immigrant, and I'm a proud member of Iowa CCI Action Fund. <laughs> I am so excited to be here with like-minded progressive to hear Alicia Garza's powerful message today. In these times, it is essential to remember that we are all in this together. And what that means is that there are systems in place that were designed to oppress everyday people. We need to understand that just because these systems have been around forever doesn't mean that they are right. These systems affect all of us, but disproportionately, they affect people of color. Race intersects every social issue in this country. And that's why we must keep this at the forefront in all of our campaigns and all of our fights for justice. It is why our power and our main voices in the progressive movement also have to look different. It is time for us to be bold, to speak truth to power, and stop being afraid to say what needs to be said to hold elected leaders accountable. As communities of color, as progressives, it's time to stop just giving our votes away. Our votes are oftentimes taken for granted, and it is time to challenge politicians and make them earn our votes. We are all in this together. It doesn't matter if you live in rural or urban parts of the state. If you make less than $15 an hour, you deserve a living wage. Water issues affect all of us because we, not big ag, are paying more to get clean water to our families. The demise of our health system and our women's clinics affect all of us because it is low-income communities who are the first ones to be left with zero health care funding. Deportations, racial profiling, mass incarceration affect all of us because we are your neighbors, we are your family members, we are your teachers, we are your customers, we are the tax base that keeps our economy alive. This movement is about seeing those connections among our struggles, naming the issue boldly, like saying that yes, black lives matter. And taking on these campaigns together, we cannot minimize and deflect from the issue that young black men and women have become targets across this country. Not because they are men or women, but because of the color of their skin. What affects one of us affects all of us. Alicia Garza's brave and powerful movement, Black Lives Matter, is exactly about this and about so much more. And that is why you should soak up every little bit of the message that she is here uh, today to give. Alicia is an organizer, a writer, and freedom dreamer who is currently the Special Projects Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Alicia co-founded the Black Lives Matter Network, a globally recognized organizing project that focuses on combating anti-black state-sanctioned violence and the oppression of all black people. Since the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, Alicia has become a powerful voice in the media. So please, help me give a warm Iowa welcome to Alicia Garza.
I was like, I have heels on. I don't need this platform. How you doing, Iowa? It is a joy and an honor to be back in Des Moines with CCI, with all of you, building a movement that is gonna change this country. Are y'all ready? Yeah. I know y'all are ready because you're already doing it. And I'm honored to be here with y'all. You know, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I was gonna say today. And this moment comes on the heels of the four year anniversary of the birth of Black Lives Matter. Four years since George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin and got away with it. That ain't right. A powerful, powerful movement has emerged that is bigger than Black Lives Matter. We're an organization. We have 40 chapters across the world. But there are so many more organizations and groups of people who have emerged from that moment of tragedy to say we've had enough and we're gonna build the world that we deserve and nobody's gonna get in our way. Yeah. Organizations like the Dream Defenders, which took over the Florida State Capitol for 31 days to demand an end to stand your ground laws. Black Youth Project 100, which ousted a corrupt prosecutor who continued to target poor black and brown people and throw them in cages. We have made progress. And then in November, something tragic happened. We elected a kleptocrat. Y'all know what a kleptocrat is? A kleptocrat is someone who makes money off their position of power. A kleptocrat is someone who turns the halls of democracy into a business for profit at the expense of every single one of you in this room. I'm not even gonna say his name because he don't deserve it. I won't let that name pass my lips, but I will say that what happened in November was a surprise for some of us, but this is the moment when we should reflect and ask ourselves, how did this happen? Now, lots of us on our side of the table like to say, well, if so-and-so had won, this would be different, and I want to challenge that a little bit. Yes. We are in a dire moment in this country, but let's be clear, that movement, their movement, has been growing and building power for the last three decades or more. And so what happened in November wasn't a fluke, it was a culmination of effective and strategic movement building. We had a resurgence of white nationalism in this country. And I want to speak on this because I want to be really clear that those days have not passed. We saw that in November. They're not gone. Just because we elected a black man for president and he served without scandal for eight years doesn't mean doesn't mean that somebody wouldn't come in and try to exploit the fear and the anxiety that we all have about our future. And that's exactly what he did, am I right? He exploited our anxieties about how we were gonna pay our rent, how we were gonna take care of our families, how we were going to address the aging crisis in this country, 
where more and more people are aging and there's less and less care that's available. He exploited everything terrible that remains in this country. And that kind of exploitation deserves a movement that can not only respond, but that can challenge it and that can transform it. We are now in a moment where income inequality is worse than it has ever been, where a smaller and smaller group of people are hoarding all of the things that we need, not just to survive, but to live well. And then, from my estimation, the way things are going with climate and the environment, we may be pushed to get it together faster than we thought we would. So for me, there's never been a better time to challenge the movement that is gaining steam across this country. There's never been a better time for us to figure out how do we build the power that we need to transform the conditions that we live in so that we can live in the world that we deserve, that our children deserve, that our grandchildren deserve, and that generations beyond us deserve. So, when I was thinking about what I was gonna say today, all I could think about was power. When I sit in rooms like this with people like you, I think about power. I think about what it takes to build power. I think about what it takes to take power. And I think about what it takes to make power a different kind of thing. I hope that you too are obsessed with this idea of what it takes to build power. Because without it, all of the things that we care about will not come to fruition. We can't just wish change to happen. We can't just wait for somebody else to do it. We can't place it at the feet of presidential candidates. The power that we build, we must remain in control of it. Now some of us think about power as an individual thing. I understand that, that's what capitalism does to us. We gonna talk about that a little later. <laughs> we think about power like, I feel powerful today. How many people feel powerful today? <laughs> that's a beautiful thing, but it's bigger than your personal agency how you feel about yourself in this moment. Power is the, dis the ability to make decisions over your own life. Power is the ability to set the status quo. Power is the ability to reward and to punish. And let me tell you, power is also about the ability to create the narrative of who we are. When that movement talks about who we are, many of us are shocked. That's not us. That's not me. But because they have spent the last three decades building a powerful narrative about what's wrong with this country and who's to blame for it, that kind of power has translated into policies, it has translated into a culture of fear where immigrants in my community are afraid to go to school or access hospitals because they are afraid they will be rounded up by deportation forces. And these are not conspiracy theories. These are actual proposed policies that are being debated in our halls of Congress and in our state legislatures. It ain't right. But y'all, their power comes from organized money. Our power comes from organized people. Our 
power comes from collaboration, from coordination, from interdependence. We depend and rely on each other to survive. That is where our power comes from. And when people are organized, we can build power. And when we are organized, we come together and we build and we realize a broader vision for what's possible and that is the underpinnings of the movement that we are and will continue to build so that this country can live up to its promise. When we as a movement become clear about the outcomes that we seek, when we get clear about who are our friends and who are our enemies, and when we get organized across silos and differences that are actually pretty minor, our movement can translate into power. Political power, economic power, narrative power, cultural power, power. Now for some of us, power is a dirty word. We don't like that word. We don't want to wield power over other people because we see the ways in which folks do that and we see the results. I understand that. But power is a catalyst for change. And if you don't believe me, just look around you at what's happening in this country. Power is now consolidated in the wrong hands. It's consolidated in the wrong hands at the White House, in our Congress, and two-thirds of our state legislatures. As we speak, power on the other side is conspiring to change the rules about how we act together how we be together. And that must be our first task, is to dismantle and break that open. Yeah. But how are we gonna do it? That all sounds good, that all feels good, but what's it gonna take? Have no fear. Have no fear. <laughs> Have no fear, CCI is here. I think that we have to commit to the kind of organizing that transforms us. I believe that we have to commit to building the kinds of movements that calls us back to our humanity. It's not going to be easy. It never has been easy. We're gonna disappoint each other. We're gonna make each other upset. We're gonna make each other mad. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna disagree. But I'm here to tell you, we gotta keep going. Yeah. Every morning when I wake up, I think about how to build the kind of movement across difference for the sake of our collective transformation. I believe in the potential of who we can be. I believe in your dreams, and I believe that our dreams are not that far apart from one another. There are gonna be times when we get tempted to fall back into patterns that don't serve us. There are gonna be times when we say to each other, you know, I want a different world, but I really just want people to stop talking about race. Why do they keep talking about that? <laughs> there are gonna be times when we say to each other, you know, I really want a different world, but I just wish women would be quiet, man. We're, we're down the road already, what's the problem? There's gonna be times when we say, I really want a different world, but these immigrants, these immigrants are taking something from me. And 
every single time that happens, I want us to say we will not go back. We will not go back. I believe that we have to resist amnesia at all costs. Every single time we try to go back into that comfort place, I want you to think about how you felt on November 8th, 2016, and I want you to say to yourself, no way I'm going back. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to say we deserve a better world. We deserve a movement that is grounded in love and interconnectedness and hope and innovation and values and care. I want you to say ain't no way I'm going back. I have had so many moments since November, where I have said to myself, I'm just done with all of this. Who do they think they are? They're trying to do something. I don't want, they're not gonna change anything. We've done that before. We've already seen that before. Let me tell you something. We haven't seen anything yet. I understand that it's hard to imagine a world where those of us who have been hurt, slighted, discriminated against, who've hurt one another, all get to fit. It's a challenge to imagine what it might look like to heal our humanity in the face of brutality and violence and disagreement and discord. However, we can and we must resist. We can and we must resist because a movement that is cynical makes no steps forward. We can and we must resist because a movement that rejects the potential of transformation is a movement that is destined to fail. A movement that believes that no change is possible will produce no change. When we talk about racism and sexism and capitalism and all those isms, all of those systems function to keep us fighting one another while the people who are really hurting us get away with murder, literally. And so, when I get discouraged, I think about my mama, Harriet Tubman. I call her mama. She's like my patron saint. I pray to Harriet Tubman sometimes. Because if you know anything else about Harriet Tubman, besides the fact that she ran and created the Underground Railroad and freed lots and lots of slaves, then you would know that Harriet Tubman loved us so much that she pushed us to be free, even when we weren't ready to free ourselves. If you know anything about Harriet Tubman, you would know that even if you weren't ready to get free, she would leave the light on for you because she knew eventually you were gonna come around. If you knew anything about Harriet Tubman, you would know that she wouldn't rest just because you were scared. She would push you to persist. And in fact, there are stories about Harriet putting the gun to your back, like, you not gonna turn back today. <laughs> For Harriet, there was no other way but forward. Let us all be Harriet Tubman's today. In this movement that we are building together, we will be clear about who our enemies actually are. We will resist throwing each other away. We will remember that accountability is not revenge. We will remember that individuals are not systems. 
we will remember that individuals perpetuate systems through consent and through force. That means that each of us has a choice. Each of us has a choice to make every day, every second, every minute, every hour about who we are going to be today, tomorrow, and for the future. We will remember that only organizing interrupts corruption. And that is where our possibility lies. Our possibility lies in organizing, unlocking new choices, unlocking new opportunities. So if we hope to win, we better organize. <laughs> Finally, I think we deserve a rematch. I want a rematch. I'm like, that wasn't a fair fight. That wasn't a fair fight, and I got something for you. I think women deserve a rematch. I think farmers deserve a rematch. I think low-income people deserve a rematch. I think black folks deserve a rematch. I think Muslims deserve a rematch. I think immigrants deserve a rematch. America deserves a rematch. So I'm not done with this administration. In fact, we're just getting started. But bigger than that, I believe that we can and will continue to build the kind of movement that will not just transform us, which is important, but it will transform the way that power operates in and of itself. I believe that we can transform democracy so that more of us, in fact, all of us, get to make the decisions that impact our lives. I want a rematch, and I believe that we will win. Do y'all believe we're gonna win? Do y'all believe we're gonna win? Stand up if you believe we're gonna win. Thanks, y'all. Well, thank you so much, Alicia, for those incredibly inspiring, powerful words. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I do believe that we will win. That is so important to keep in mind. So now we will have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, just want to clarify a little bit how it's going to work. We're going to have two staffers here and here. They're raising their hands over there with the mic, and you can line up behind them. Um, please remember to keep your question in the form of a question and under 30 seconds, so that way we can both hear a lot of the questions that people have and then give time for Alicia to answer um, without having to, you know, hear these really long-winded statements, which are important, but right now it's questions. Under 30 seconds, and if you extend a little bit over, our staff will politely cut you off. So please start lining up over here and over here. And let's get ready to hear a little bit more of Q&A from Alicia Garza.
Good morning, Alicia. Morning. Over here on your right. Over there. Over here. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. The experience I'm having is that, um, and I used to work for SANE in Philadelphia long, long, long ago, that um, I don't feel a part of the community I want to change. I feel sort of isolated. I'm very comfortable here in this group, but when I go back home to rural Iowa, um, I don't connect that well with the farmers. I mean, we can chat and be friendly, but I'm not really an integral part of their community. I'm not an integral part of the uh, city of Fairfield, which is a little 10,000 population town. How do we here, who not a lot of black faces in this audience, um, enthusiastic people, how do we find the people who are with us, but who don't come to these kind of meetings? Uh-huh. Great question. Um, first and foremost, I think we have to remember that change takes time, and it takes a lot of listening. A lot of listening. So uh, I didn't get to speak on this very much, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my experience in the Women's March. Now, when I went to the Women's March in DC, and it was amazing. It was, I know it was, I was watching. I was really struck by how many people had been activated for the first time ever, or for the first time in many, many years. And it was a heavy lift for them to come to a march in DC. These are things that we do a lot. Right? We march, we protest, we come into meetings. And as an organizer, one of the things I know is that even the people who might have sympathies, who might be questioning, I'm not totally sure I like how things are going right now. I might like some things, I don't like others. There's not a lot of entry points for those folks into our spaces. And so that has to change. But the other thing that I would say is keep working on building those relationships. That's right. And relationships that are literally just about getting to know someone. Because that too is organizing. Understanding what people have been through, what they do every single day, what they think about things, and not clobbering them over the head with your opinion of things. Right? That's the kind of thing that creates openness to new ways of being acknowledging people where they are, not saying we're not gonna keep pushing you, but saying we're not gonna spend every minute bludgeoning you with our politics. That's right. The right has done that really well, correct? Right. They meet people where they are. They grab people in churches, right? They grab people who are unemployed, and they say, hey, this is your home. Tell me about what you're afraid of. I have a solution for that. You see where I'm going with this? So one thing that we can all do in this very moment is commit ourselves to getting to know each other a little better. That's right. It sounds really simple, but I think that it is revolutionary in this moment. Thank you for your question. Hi, Alicia. I'm John Ashton. Hey. Um, pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I have only been involved with CCI for a few years now. Um, and CCI, along with the United States Student Association, have really like shaped who I am as an organizer um, and really pulled me into organizing. I wanted to know if you would share with us um, how you got involved with organizing, um, who influenced who you are as an organizer, um, and kind of uh, different organizations that helped you along the way. Yeah, thanks for asking. So I started as an activist when I was 12. <laughs> I didn't know it was activism, but something made me mad. So I grew up with a single mother, and my mom talked to me a lot about what it meant to try and raise a child like me by herself. <laughs> 
And when I was 12 in my school district, I live in California, you know, it's like progressive Mecca in some places in the Bay Area. <laughs> um, and in my school district, they were having a debate about whether or not to offer contraception in school nurses' offices. Now at 12, believe it or not, lots of people in my community were already having sex. And I know people have a lot of feelings about that, but there's how we feel and then there's what people do. Yeah? And so for me, what made me so angry about it was if you really want to prevent people from either having sex before they might be ready or having children before they might be ready, why not give them all the things that they need to be able to make good decisions for themselves? And then I started getting politicized because, you know, that was during the first era of Bush, where he was governing on an agenda of family values that was really his family's values and didn't really think about what other people's values might be and how they might bring all those things together. And so from there, I became involved in lots of different organizations, some of which, to be honest with you, completely broke my heart. I had many moments where I was like, I put all my energy and love into this organization and now there's this thing I've decided I don't like. But I kept coming back. Yeah? So student organizing, I, I actually worked with the UC Student Association. I was a part of the United States Student Association. Um, I have done lots of work around tenant rights, economic justice, knocking doors in East and West Oakland, talking to people who were not a part of organizations, didn't want to be a part of organizations, but they did want a vehicle that would fight back, that they could be a part of. So, that's some of my trajectory, if we want to talk longer. I mean, I've been a part of many different efforts. <laughs> but I say all that to say that I believe that organizations are the smallest unit of change. And that for us to build the kinds of movements that we hope to imagine, we have to be a part of organizations. Organizations are where we grow our vision. Organizations are where we allow ourselves to shape and be shaped. And organizations keep us from feeling isolated or like we have to take it all on our backs by ourselves. So, y'all are doing a pretty good thing here by being a part of CCI. Keep going. And next time we have this convention, because this is amazing, it's like 700 people. Next time we have this convention, how many? Ooh, a thousand. So I know when I come back in two years, this convention hall is not going to be big enough for y'all. And that's going to be because of the organizing that y'all do. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Abby Knowles. Um, Hi, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in Indivisible, Iowa. It's um, yes. an association like CCI. That's what's up. Um, I, I, I do my best to try to make, the, make where I live, my community, a better place. Mm -hmm. And I need to ask you something. Uh -huh. Ever since you've wanted change, how long did it take you to actually do the change? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So Abby, there's different levels of change. I've been working my whole life for the change that I want to see and I'm not done. And I may not be done when I die. That's just the reality, I wanna be honest with you. I don't wanna sugarcoat it, yeah? But there have been changes that I have made with teams of people like this that I am so proud of. Sometimes those changes take months, sometimes they take years, and it all depends on how organized we are. I'll give you an example. In my community, because of budget cuts at the state level, they took away the yellow school buses. That's how a lot of people get to school, yeah? It's one of the only ways that people can get to school, especially when you have working parents. So we were really worried about what were people gonna do to get to school if there was no yellow school bus. 
So we started organizing. We started making sure that our city would subsidize transportation for young people. When we first went, they told us we were nuts. They said, there's no way you're asking for handouts. I mean, they went down the list of things. But what we knew was that our people deserved education and deserved dignity. The other thing we knew was that the city was giving free rides to tech workers every day. And in fact, those same bus stops where the buses couldn't really stop, the transportation for wealthy workers, they were using our infrastructure, but not giving back to our city. So what did we do? We made the tech companies pay for free transit for young people. But we didn't stop there. Then we got the program expanded to seniors. We got the program expanded to people with disabilities. Eventually, we want to get all transportation to be free for people who live in our city. That fight took us about two years. And it was faster than usual because we had been building an organization of people who knew how to fight, who were ready to fight, and who were not gonna give up. Now that's a big change, but not as big as the change that I wanna see. So the way I see it, Abby, we gotta get a lot of changes to get to the big change that we want. And every change that we fight for should help us open up new possibilities for even bigger and bigger change. So what I would say to you, is that don't worry about how long it's gonna take. Worry about how many people you can get to come with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is gonna be the last question. Okay. Hi, Alicia. Hi. Hi, my name is Paula Egan. I'm Hi, a Ms. recent Paula. transplant from the Bay Area. Yeah. Yeah. I love Des Moines though. <laughs> Two-part question. Okay. First, how are we going to get young people activated to get out there and vote? And when are you going to run for national office? <laughs> I see you. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know is the answer to your second question. <laughs> Um, and I don't know what else I want to say about that, except um, I, two things, just to be honest. You see me trying to squirrel out of this one? Uh, so I recently um, built a project called the Black Futures Lab, which is focused on a couple of things. One, it's focused on transforming our communities into constituencies that can wield power political power. Because I think that there's something very wrong with a movement that doesn't take seriously how to use the tools of electoral organizing to disrupt the status quo. And so part of what that means is recruiting and identifying and training people to run for office that are not career politicians, they're not people who have gone their whole lives trying to be president. They're people like you and me who know a little something about what our communities need and who are ready to try and govern. Yeah? Um, I don't know what that trajectory is for myself, but I'll be honest with you, I've been more open to it than I ever have been before. Now don't go, now if I open Twitter in a minute and hear y'all talking about, I said I was running, we're gonna have a problem. <laughs> Just saying. Um, on your first question, I, I think young people are already involved. Um, I think that more could be involved, but I think that young people are already involved. I mean, look at Abby. Abby just like blew my mind. I feel like I need to do something different with my life. You know what I mean? 
Um, but I think where we have to make an intervention is what are we giving young people something to be involved in? You know? You know? Like a lot of people in this last election were so mad, they were like, all oh, these people sat out. And I'm like, yeah, that makes me mad too, but let's just keep it 100. What were they being asked to turn out for? That's our job, right? That's our job. That's what we should hold politicians accountable to. I don't wanna hear the same BS and get the same results. I want you to put some work in, right? And you have somebody coming here a little bit later that put some work in. I also really think we have to pay attention to outreach in different communities and not just, I'm gonna show up at your door and I'm gonna tell you all the things you need to be doing. But like, I want a candidate that goes around the country and like listens for a year. Like legit sits and talks with people and listens and from that comes an agenda that people can be excited about. An agenda that people can vote and fight for as opposed to, well, it's not the other guy. That's not inspiring. I think we deserve more. And I know we're gonna work together to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Garza.